forward up to the cloud so that way it can pick me up and create the uh, captions for later. All right. I will keep track of the chat like usual. All right, so I think we're good to go. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like normal, I will um, do the, uh, I'll be flipping back and forth between Mark Edit and the uh, slides. Um, so I went ahead and pulled together a small script that I have on another computer. Um, everything we talk about today should be able to be worked on on the Mac as well. Uh, in fact, there's been a number of things that I've been changing along the way over the last week to kind of fill in gaps um, on the Mac system. It's been interesting. Most folks tend to not use that particular version of MarkEdit. It's an actual fairly small uh, user community, um, about a 800 to 1,000, 1,500 active users, but compared to the Windows side where it's closer to 25 to 30,000 active users, it hasn't been the set that I spent a lot of time on, but it looks like a lot of people have Macs at home, and so I've been filling in gaps. So anyways, everything we talk about here should also be applicable on the Mac system. So we're going to talk about specific things. It'll be a little bit eclectic, I think, uh, maybe, um, in terms of the topics we go over, but a lot of these are related to questions that have come up um, over the past couple of weeks. And so I've been kind of keeping a, a list. Uh, the first two, um, talking about how to merge data between records, um, that's come up um, uh, more than once, uh, both on the listserv and sent to me um, specifically. Integrations, because a lot of people are working um, at home and they find that um, uh, they're uh, unable to work directly with their library catalogs due to um, issues with um, uh, firewalls. A lot of times the individual um, vendors provide uh, more open resource access through the API, even though the most APIs tend to be throttled. So I'll talk about how Mark Edit works with um, the various APIs. Uh, look at OCLC and ALMA specifically. You can set up APIs for uh, access for um, COHA local integration um, um, and working with a few other vendors, though um, there are some limits in terms of how Mark Edit can do that. Uh, we'll talk about clustering tools and we'll talk about moving data into and out of OpenRefine. The OpenRefine questions came up um, a couple times, so the order is going to be flipped here. I'll talk about OpenRefine first, then Mark Edit's built in clustering tools. Um, and hopefully that will cover about 45 minutes or so, and then I'll answer any questions that you guys have. Um, and I'll kind of keep an eye out if I see uh, anything in the chat pop up. And like usual, uh, this session's being recorded, so um, the uh, session will get posted um, sometime within a couple hours after this finish for, for folks who weren't able to attend the session. All right, so let's talk specifically about merging data. So um, this is Mark Edit's uh, merge records tool. Uh, the merge records tool um, is designed specifically uh, with a couple of different use cases in mind, and I tried to, to write out um, kind of the specific modes and use cases um, that um, come up on a, on a fairly regular basis. So the first use case would be um, having uh, a set of a source set of files, generally probably a set of records maybe that come from your local catalog, um, and then another file that you've gotten from a vendor, and that data um, basically duplicates everything in your local record except for maybe a handful of pieces of information, like possibly um, uh, URLs or subjects or something like that. Um, if you're like um, uh, my local institution, a lot of times we don't want to overlay um, a vendor record with a local record over a local record because we may have added information to the local record that we want to keep, but um, that local record um, may have, uh, for example, um, a OCLC number that's no longer valid, it's been merged, um, or, or something like that. So 
the merge tool takes into account a handful of different things in terms of how it does its merging. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, provides a number of different options for merging, but the, the the primary use case when this got started was basically taking data from one file, um, usually a source file, and then a, a merge file and merging them together. And in fact, this tool was originally created back when um, I worked at, at Oregon State uh, University, and um, we were in the process as a consortium um, using uh, WorldCat, uh, OCLC Navigator was their uh, consortial product they'd put up for a while um, to support um, consortiums having a shared catalog and part of what we needed to go through was reconcil uh, reconciliation um, to get OCLC numbers into catalog records. And so this tool was basically built um, because we didn't want to overlay um, our local records and so what we were doing was getting Excel sheets back um, from OCLC that basically had an OCLC number and um, our record number. We would use MarkEdit's delimited text translator to create very brief records that basically had a match point and the field that we wanted to merge into our source records. And then we would use the merge records tool to merge to match on the OCLC number or and and take the, uh, the data that, or the, the record number, sorry, the bibliographic record number, and then pull the OCLC number into our record. So that was kind of the first case that this came up for. Now it gets used for a lot of other things. So vendor records, pulling URLs, pulling new subjects into data, um, a variety of different things. The second mode that the merge records tool facilitates is taking a single file that has lots of duplicate records in it and consolidating them into a single record. So um, unlike the deduplication tool, which would keep one copy of a duplicate, in this case, um, the tool is actually assuming that you want specific data elements from all of those records, but you wanna consolidate everything into a single record. So let's say um, I had um, a record set where um, you were using a multi-record approach, uh, say for, for volumes, and you needed to consolidate those down to a single record. You could have a match point and move specific fields into a single record so that when you were finished, you would have a single record um, that's been um, created from all of the various variations inside of that, that mark record um, file. So those are really the two um, kind of proto use cases that this tool was designed um, to work with. And I put some examples here of how you turn those features on. So the merging data across two files gets activated when MarkEdit sees that the source file and the merge file are different. When it sees that they're different, the tool falls into the mode where it assumes that you're taking um, this file here is your source and you're merging data from this file into that source file. When the source file and the merge file are the same, the tool will then fall into the mode where it's consolidating data. So it assumes that what you need to do is you need to take um, like records inside the file and collapse them down. Um, into uh, a single consolidated record. So that's how MarkEdit determines which mode um, to use when working with the, uh, the merge records tool. So how do the merges actually happen? So inside of MarkEdit, um, the tool works by um, working on match points. Um, and so those match points are set um, by determining what the record identifier is within um, the, between the two different record sets. So MarkEdit uses um, a set of predefined um, uh, record numbers. Though this field here is editable, you can type in whatever you want to. So if the number, uh, record number that you're using isn't in that field, you can type that in. Um, there's some special things MarkEdit does. So when you set the record identifier as 001, MarkEdit makes the assumption that you are looking at OCLC data and it will use information found in the 001 
the 019 and the 035, anything prefixed with OCLC. Um, and we'll pull those together into a common um, uh, index and then merge based on information found there. So this is really useful if, for example, your source records are from your local catalog and have an OCLC number that's been um, merged into another record. So now that OCLC number on the merge record is different, but the uh, essentially the breadcrumb of the old information would be found in the 019. And so MarkEdit would be able to recognize that and make the match based on the information that was there. Um, and I'm going to pop up in MarkEdit because I want to explain the Mark 21 here in a minute. Um, the Unicode encoding option. So this is an option that you um, should consider um, checking uh, if your data is um, not uh, Latin-based, essentially if it's multi-byte characters, multi-byte languages. Uh, the way MarkEdit evaluates data for merges isn't exact matches. Um, it's doing what's called more fuzzy matching. And when that checkbox isn't checked, the way that MarkEdit is evaluating data is it's evaluating data at a binary level. And so that means it's not reading, um, for example, like an A, it sees code point, I think 65, um, if you're looking at a, a base 10 uh, a language. And so it's reading the, the code point values rather than the characters. That gets problematic when you start working with bi wide byte languages. So languages like Hebrew and Chinese and Arabic, um, languages that use um, multiple code points to make up a single character. Uh, what ends up happening is the tool will see um, characters uh, as similar, even though they're not, um, because the number of because the code points that make them up um, end up looking similar, but if you change one value, it obviously is a very, very different character. So in cases where you're working with multi-byte languages, it's better to check the Unicode encoding box because then what MarkEdit does is it switches to <clears throat> matching specifically on characters. So rather than looking at data as code point values, um, uh, so as the, the base 10 actual value of the character, it actually reads the character. Um, so it would see uh, the, the actual character value. Um, and so that makes it um, much more accurate if the match points happen to be um, on values that are string based. If they're numeric based, then it probably doesn't matter. But if you're, for example, you're matching the titles or you're using the Mark 21 option, which does do um, a lot of string based matching, using that Unicode encoded value um, is probably desirable. And in fact, um, you can use it all the time. The main reason why um, that value is unchecked um, uh, by default is I often um, uh, am working with data where my match points are um, numeric values only. And um, the, uh, it's a lot faster to process the data um, at a, a numeric level rather than at a, uh, an actual character level. And so I do it for speed. Um, but if I was working with data that was more variable, um, I would probably check that box all the time. Um, most people would never notice the difference in, in how much time it takes to process the file. I just, uh, I do. Um, all right, so let's look at uh, the merge record that I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, I want to actually run through one of these. And I'd also like to talk about um, the, the Mark 21 match point. So where do you find the merge records tool? So um, you can find it um, by typing in here and that will take you to the merge records tool. Um, you'll also find it under tools, mark processing tools and merge records. So that'll help get you to the pathway. All right, so I've got a couple of files that I've staged um, that I'll walk through here in a minute, but I wanted to talk before we got there to about um, this value here. So we're gonna run into times when working with um, data where the reality is um, we may not have um, an actual match point. So the data itself um, that we're working with um, may have no 
real common match points, the way that we tell that a record is a duplicate is by looking at the characteristics of the record. So uh, parts of titles, um, uh, forms, dates, you know, as an individual, we can look at those things and make those determinations really quickly. It's a little bit more difficult on the side here where we're dealing with um, Mark Records where I have a, a, an algorithm that's trying to determine match points. So in cases where there are no match points, um, MarkEdit uses um, a Mark 21 option. It's a heuristic matching option. Um, and you can customize the fields that are used to determine whether or not a record um, is a match. So here we can see that the tool is looking at LDRs, uh, information in the 008, uh, control number data, uh, main entry data, information about the title, um, about uh, miscellaneous fields. All of that information gets kind of souped together. And each one of these values has a particular weight, some way more, some way less. As you check and uncheck the boxes, the program tries to rebalance the equation based on the pieces of information that's being removed. Um, as MarkEdit evaluates records, um, if a set of records doesn't have parts of these that are there, then it um, counts it against the record a little bit, but it, it changes the weighting somewhat. So the tool tries to use a, a smart process to create a kind of fuzzy matching score that allows you to use a um, more heuristic approach to determining matches. Um, I will say that if you use this option and you uncheck a lot of data, you could run into a case where you uncheck enough information that it's difficult for the application to rebalance the equation. Um, but that becomes very obvious when you look at the results set. So it's worth playing around with if you're in the position where you don't have good match points. So I'm going to go ahead and select um, a file, a couple files. I have a, a set of files here, so I'm going to go ahead and pull these up and put those in here, and we're going to have a merged. All right, we're going to set a different match point. So the match point is going to be the 001, and I'm going to open this up so you can see why I picked this 035. Um, subfield subfield A. So you can create um, match points that go across multiple fields just by using that pipe. Um, it's a fairly new option um, in MarkEdit. Um, and so that allows you to do that. So let me show you really quickly what records I'm merging here. So you can get a feel for how the program is doing its work. So here's merge one. And then here's merge two. Yeah, these are the right records. All right, so what we have here um, inside the records, we have two um, sets. One is coming, uh, looks like it's been generated from a, a DPLA. Um, and what we have here is um, a local set of records where we have an OCLC number. We see that the OCLC number shows up at the 035 subfield A. So we're going to match between two different match points. Um, the data that uh, I'm going to try and pull into this local set um, is we'll pull the 099, um, we'll pull the 910, we'll pull the 998. Um, none of those are represented in this record, so it'll be really easy to tell as they match and pull the records together. All right, so, um, so I'm going to go ahead and show how this works. So I went ahead and selected the two files that we have here. We have the save file. Um, which is going to be a merged file. Uh, we have the record identifiers, which are the 001 as well as the 035 subfield A. So MarkEdit's going to compare those two fields together. Um, we can check it as Unicode encoded or not. Since these are both um, numeric based fields with Latin based data as prefixes, I know that I don't need to do that. So I'm not going to. Um, and so then what I need to do is I need to select the fields that I want to merge over. So in this case, I looked at them and I was going to take the 099 field, if I could find one. Um, 
I was going to take, let's see what the other fields were. I was going to take the, the 9, 10 field, and I'm going to take the uh, 9, 9, 8 field. So if this was a process that I was going to be using um, on a regular basis, we can go to settings and we can load and save these field settings. So if I was going to be merging um, record sets over and over again on like data, um, I could save the criteria that I've created here and just reload it. So that way I don't have to load it again and again. Um, can you put more than two? Yeah, you can put as many of them as you want um, into the, the match data. You just have to use pipes in between them and you have to use for anything other than a control value, you have to use um, a subfield code. So if you were going to match um, for example, the 035, 037, and 001, it would have to be the 001, a pipe, and 035, whatever the subfield is that you're matching on, and then the 037, whatever the subfield is that you're matching on. And essentially, MarkEdit normalizes those together as what I think of as kind of a hybrid, um, a hybrid control number in terms of how it treats the data. In a lot of ways, it treats the data the same way that internally I treat um, ISBNs because ISBNs can have both alpha and numeric data together. Um, and so it creates this hybrid approach to filter matches together. But yes, you can have as many pipes as you want. The pipe is the delimiter. You can have as many of them as you want. Um, obviously, the more of them that you have, the more uh, uh, possibilities you have to get. Um, <clears throat> you could get matches that, that are false positives depending on what your data looks like, but you're gonna know your data best. All right, so mark edit by default um, creates, we'll just import this data as new fields when it does the merge. If you wanna overlay existing data, you can check this overlay existing items. And so mark edit will replace the 090, the 910 and the 98 if they existed in a record during the merging process. You can also tell mark edit to merge only unique items. So this is really handy if you're merging, say, vendor data into local data, because maybe some vendors have added some subjects that you would like to keep, but you only want to keep them if they're unique. They're not already replicated in your source. You could tell it to mark edit to merge only unique items, and the tool will assess the data that it's merging into the record set, and it'll only take the data that's unique. So that way you don't end up with a lot of duplicates during the process. <clears throat> the last value is this confidence value. This is only used if you're using the Mark 21 um, matching option. And that value um, tells MarkEdit how confident um, the um, heuristic algorithm needs to be before it considers something a duplicate. Um, originally, this value wasn't something that you could change. Um, but I started running into um, use cases from users where they knew what their data looked like. The matches needed to be scaled down. The, the, the confidence value needed to be scaled down to something like 40% in order for the, the merges to work um, the way that they wanted them to because the data was so, um, because the data was so um, uh, wonky between the two, two files but they were really familiar with the way that their data worked. And so they could make that decision. And so understanding that people were gonna have different needs um, based on how the tool determined the, the value of when the match should occur, um, I went ahead and exposed the um, heuristical uh, score that um, you were allowed to move up or down <clears throat> based on the information that uh, was present in your in your record and based on the, your, your familiarity with the data that's there. So, so we figure out what information um, we wanna merge. Um, we decide what options we wanna take. Um, again, if we're gonna do this more than once, whether or not we need to save that information or just reload it in the file. If we decide we wanna get rid of one of these, we can click on it and make it go away um, or we can clear them. Um, if, for example, and I'm going to do this really quick, let's say we wanted to, to merge large groups. So let's say we wanted to take all of the, the subjects. Um, we can do it by range and mark edit will add to that range. So that way we can pull them all at once. 
make a mistake, we can clear them out so that way they're not there anymore. Um, and then just put the information that we want back. Make sure those are the right fields. Nine. Okay, let's see what actually shows up. Nine, ten, and then eight. When we're finished, we click next. The tool goes through the, the files that are there and then it creates a merge um, outcome. So if we look at the uh, merged file, uh, we'll see um, inside this file that um, the, there were no 099s in the original file and 099 was found um, based on matching the 00. 01 and the 035 together between the two files. Um, we also see the, the 910 that was brought in um, and the 998 that was brought into the record set. So the tool allows you to very quickly pull that informa information together um, and merge the records. Um, so I'm not going to do the example of what happens if you have a single file. Um, it essentially does the same thing. The only difference is rather than having to compare two files together, the tool essentially um, is parsing a single file and essentially taking the first record that it finds um, and using that as the representative record and then collapsing record data up into that set. So that way you end up having a single record when it's finished that represents all of the data found within that file that are considered duplicates as it collapses the record sets together. All right, so that's how the merge records tool works. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, integrations because uh, this has come up as well. So MarkEdit works um, with, well, we'll just look at these. I'm just gonna look at these real quick. So, cause MarkEdit looks slightly different. I'm gonna close this cause that's a different video. That's one you can go look at yourself. All right, so. All right, so integration. So MarkEdit um, has a couple of different ways that it integrates with ILS systems. And right now, um, those integrations tend to be limited to certain ILSs. So inside of the preferences, there's a place called ILS integrations. Um, just as a point of reference, if you've created a set of integrations, say like on a work machine, and you wanna bring them to your local machine, um, you don't have to recreate them. You can go to help um, share configuration settings, integration settings, and export your integration settings, and then just re-import them on your computer um, uh, that you're bringing them into. And then that way you don't have to recreate them over and over again. And that process should work going from Windows to Mac, Mac to Windows. Um, especially since I've updated uh, the Mac version recently this week, I was noticing that there was a, a small bug in the, the Mac import process. So the ILS integrations will start here. So this looks slightly different on the Windows version than on the Mac version. Um, the reason why is the Windows version can use profiles right now, which means that you can have multiple ILS systems um, defined within um, the Windows version of MarkEdit. Uh, the Mac version right now, you can only define one profile. Um, I'll probably change that. There's a good reason why you might have multiple ILS profiles defined. Um, especially if you're all, an Alma or a Koha user, where you may have a um, production and a staging uh, environment for, for testing, in which case you might want to be able to um, set up uh, MarkEdit to work on your staging instance first, and make sure everything works the way you want it to, and then create a um, production um, defined value. So, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you what this looks like. So the, the tool has um, profiles here, it tells you what the selected profile is. If you have one, to turn the option on, you check the enable options. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, open up um, my default. So this is um, uh, an Alma instance. Um, the folks at Exlibris, um, there are, um, they've, uh, I think that they do their, their API work uh, fairly well, and um, they work really well with uh, third-party folks. So one of the things I've, I've appreciated is that they um, have provided an environment for me to work, which is um, fairly unique among ILS systems. Um, I have a difficult time working with a number of vendors because they tend to require you to be a customer to see their APIs. 
um, and that's problematic in the way that I work with Mark Ed. Um, I usually have to have somebody who's a facilitator in those cases. So um, in this case, I, 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 they, they tend to do a very nice job in terms of how this works. So the way that Mark Edit works is you set up um, the name of your profile uh, in the Windows version, the Mac version, you would just um, set the name of the, what you're gonna use. The type, um, connection settings, uh, information about um, whether it's a username, password, or token, uh, whether you're using the system proxy, um, Mark Edit has to use a proxy as part of the connection string. If you're going to ignore SSL certificate errors, which depending on, uh, for most staging instances, you would have to check that box because a lot of times they use self-signed certificates. Um, if you're using um, Z3950 or SRU as your search, um, the reason why that option is there, because right now both Koha and Alma would require that. Um, there are some instances that are looking at providing an API for search. And so inside of Mark Edit's ILS platform structure, there's a place for API settings. And so Mark Edit understands how to generate search uh, requests based on whether it's, um, if this is checked, then it's looking for settings specific to Z3950 SRU. If it's not checked, then it's assuming that the data is going to get pulled from the, um, the the helper library that gets created to provide the integration. Um, so all this stuff gets generated. The new version of Mark Edit Windows, which is why I'm showing it this way, um, uh, has some cool stuff. So let me just create a new one here. Um, used to be there was a lot of information you had to select by default. So um, if you are an Alma user, there are certain values that I know show up all the time. So if you're a North American user, this is the hosted instance you're going to use. If you're in the EU, it's going to be this one. If you're in, I don't know what all of these are, but there's, um, they have basically have these particular um, endpoints based on where you are in the world. So it tries to help you out a little bit in terms of figuring stuff out. It blanks things out because it knows that Alma doesn't request a username. They give you tokens, um, that kind of stuff. It knows that you're going to be using Z39.50 SRU, so it checks that box automatically. And then we have the option to select um, from the currently defined ILS options. If the one that you're looking for isn't in that list, then you can create new and tell it to generate either an SRU or a Z39.50 instance, which then you can select um, and become your instance that you work with. Um, so the tools trying to, one of the things I've been trying to do within Mark Edit particularly within um, the ILS integrations and, and especially within the Windows version where there are multiple profiles is trying to help facilitate the creation of things. Um, so that way it's, it's easier to know how particular values need to be set up. All right. So once you've defined um, an ILS um, option and created it, um, you would go ahead and say okay and save it um, and mark edit would reboot and then you would find within the mark editor that the tool will create some new um, uh, menus so in this case we have a menu that's created for alma um, and so i can now um, search um, against the resource um, so i have a, an integration instance i'm not sure exactly it's a test version so there's not a lot of data in it so I sometimes have a hard time remembering what uh, what data is actually there um, let me just see if that'll find anything so there's nothing in there I have to look for some stuff anyways so there's um you could find uh, you can search for for data um, again I can't remember what's all there it doesn't look like I'm gonna find anything um, but you can search for it and then retrieve it um, it'll pull it back into your instance here um, into the Mark Editor. The Mark Editor will um, create a, um, a, a 999 field for holdings data. If you want holdings data, um, it might create one for, um, uh, for if you have any holdings records attached to it, that's so Mark Edit knows what record to, to bring it back to. Um, uh, if you noticed in the search, there are um, batch search options. You can pick a file kind of thing. Um, so the tool provides you some options to be able to do um, different kinds of queries. And then here's all holdings data, all items. So within Alma, 
Um, the tool turns certain features on and off based on uh, what the integration APIs that have been shared with me are allowed to do. Um, so, for example, if I know that holdings data can hold, then the tool will allow that as an option. Um, if I don't, um, if I'm not aware of the API at the time when I did the integration, didn't allow for that information, then that wouldn't be an option. Uh, you can, so you can pull records that are in sets, and that's not what the batch search is for, but it, I suppose it could be. Um, the way that MarkEdit does searching um, is defined in the um, actual um, uh, SRU definitions. Whoops, sorry, wrong one. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you what the uh, integration looks like here. So, so the way that MarkEdit works is you have uh, a custom profile. So Alma uses a custom profile for their SRU instance. And if you're going to pull sets, you probably need to use the SRU index. Um, you point it to the URL where that um, SRU instance lives, uh, metadata schema, um, the version, the profile, and then you set the, um, the index uh, that MarkEdit will search against. So in this case, there are specific indexes. So index author, title, subject, um, record index, um, and not all of these are exactly right because I was, um, I know the record number and the keyword you index isn't right because I quickly threw this together this morning and I didn't check my um, um, SRU explain um, to see what the actual values are. Um, but you can do one of two things. Um, if you don't want to deal with understanding um, how the raw SRU request would look like, you could basically, um, for a search, change this title index, say to Alma dot, and I believe the way they do there, if you look, Alma sets up an index for collection sets. So I think it's maybe something like, um, uh, I forget what they are, because they, they tend to be, um, they tend to be um, local. But let's say my collection set was indexed as 998 nine, collection, something like that. So I could then save that, and then when I did a title index search, it would actually search the for the collection set. And I could do that in batch, or I could do that as just a single search looking for that collection set and pulling all of the data at once. Um, the other option uh, is to actually do a raw query, in which case MarkEdit allows you to pass a raw SRU query. So if um, I knew what the index was, I could change it to say alma.title equals and then my title data and then do the search. And so MarkEdit then will pass that as the um, criteria um, to the system. And that's actually part of the reason why when you're playing around with this, there's this button here because this button will show you, will copy to your clipboard the information that's there so that you can see what information is there. So see, I, the reason I'm not getting any results back is because I picked the wrong institution code. I forgot what it was when I quickly threw it together. Um, but this will show you the diagnostic of um, what your query is doing when it makes the request um, on the SRU server. So for example, if you made an error or made a mistake um, with setting up your query um, or picking the wrong index or whatnot, then you could, you could change it there. Um, the batch search option is really, it's a file that includes multiple search uh, entries that are either, um, you know, titles or what have you. Uh, they can only be one value or they can be raw values where you actually create an SRU string um, or a Z39.50 string. And then it'll query each one of those lines in order and download those directly into um, the Mark Editor um, rather than allowing you to select from options. Uh, so, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, so yes, you can search um, for collection sets in Alma. You could search multiple collection sets in Alma using the batch search tool, or you could search just against a collection set if you knew what the index code was in the SRU instance um, so that you could do that work. Um, so within Alma and other integrations, um, you'll see different options here. So uh, we have search, we have update and create. Um, in Alma, for example, um, there's also this process setting. This allows you to attach tasks 
to certain parts of the import and export process. So if you wanted a task to run every time you brought record data into MarkEdit, when you downloaded it from Alma, you could set a task to do that. If you needed to change data as you exported records, um, you could have MarkEdit set um, to run a task on that action. So that's kind of like um, the same way that you, in, in connection, uh, a lot of folks will set uh, macros to run on export. because They maybe add a, an overlay code or something. Um, the tool allows you to facilitate some of that processing if you're, you're interested. So right now um, for ILS's market, it has integrations for um, three ILS systems. Um, it has integrations for the type of Alma. Um, it has an integration for Koha. Um, and folks sometimes ask me how that works. I have to be honest, I'm not super familiar with, with, the, with Koha other than the API that they use. Um, uh, the permission set tends to need to be fairly um, extensive uh, in order to use the APIs. Um, and then there's local, and local is um, a, a local database that you can use to actually allow MarkEdit to work directly with a local set. And that was actually implemented for a handful of very small vendors that had been purchasing software to run a database of maybe about 10,000 records. Um, and this allowed them to essentially use MarkEdit both as their ILS system and as their export editing system by using SQLite as their local database uh, management system. So there are different ways that you can go about that process um, in doing that work. Uh, the other integration option that's available um, is with OCLC. So MarkEdit provides a number of different um, OCLC options and in the Mac version and the Windows version, um, you can have multiple profiles for OCLC. Uh, this is partly because um, individuals who work with OCLC um, may be affiliates, so they may actually create records for other people. And so OCLC has a way to provide a key that um, you sign in through your main institution and then based on a secondary value that gets passed will allow you to catalog um, on behalf of an, another organization if your organization is there an affiliate. So MarkEdit creates profiles, so you can create profiles for your institution as well as other affiliates. Um, this is a slightly different screen than was available um, even a few months ago, and that's partly because MarkEdit has adjusted to use the new authentication method that OCLC provides. Um, I wanna make sure I point that out because that may mean that your keys no longer work. Um, OCLC has shifted to, or at least is providing, um, a true OAuth 2.0 implementation. Um, they used to not have that. It still relied on a mixture of OAuth and HMAC keys, which was kind of a hybrid approach to what they were using originally. That also required you to have these two values that nobody ever knew where they were. They were their principal ID and principal DNS. It would used to come with an email they would send you and then everybody would forget what it was and it would get lost. When they modified the process, the process now uses scopes. So basically the, um, the particular functions that um, you need to be able to perform um, and a key and a secret key and that's it. Um, so MarkEdit has transitioned to that process if you have an older key, it likely means that you have to talk, and it's not working in the new version of MarkEdit, it likely means that you have to talk to OCLC about reconfiguring the key um, to work with MarkEdit, and they will actually know what that means. Um, there's a small change that has to be made. Be made. They've been trying to do this uh, proactively, but I do run across folks who um, uh, have older keys that's, that'll run into issues occasionally. MarkEdit, when you're creating a new key, requires access to specific scopes. The WC API is the um, WorldCat search API. The config platform API it, uh, allows it to access the um, OCLC uh, registry. Um, so that way the tool can find your um, institution code, your affiliate codes if you have any, as well as the numerical ID for your um, organization within the OCLC platform. OCLC a lot of times will give you that registry ID key. You can put either the um, 
the, the value string for your institution code or the ID, but mark edit actually needs both in order to do things with the metadata key. Um, one or the other won't satisfy all the requests that need to happen. And so the tool internally will have to still go and get both. That's why the, the, the um, access to the config platform piece is required. Um, you add your key, you add your secret key. Uh, once you've put those in place, um, you hit val. So the very first time you do this, mark edit won't show any OCLC stuff. You put your keys in, you hit validate key. And what mark edit does is it does some things. So the first thing it does, it tries to access the registry. Um, then it uses what's called a validation. So it checks to see if you have an affiliate, checks that. Um, and then it does some things to see, do your credentials value uh, validate based on the new OAuth code to do the things that are in these scopes. And once it says yes, then um, those things turn green. Um, the application then sets a code inside of MarkEd to say that you're able to use the OCLC values. It turns a bunch of stuff on. Um, you click OK, MarkEd would save all the data and then you'd be good to go. Once you've validated your key and MarkEdit knows that, um, inside you'll see this piece that will become um, uh, open. Uh, it'll, it'll become enabled and this is true in the Mac version as well. Um, this gives you access to what's called the OCLC downloader. Um, if you have just a set of OCLC numbers, you can download as many records as you want. Um, if you need to limit downloads by, say, a symbol um, or multiple symbols, then the tool actually is doing a search. Your limit then is roughly about 60,000 records, I believe, um, because OCLC's API has a limit to the number of queries you can make um, per uh, day, per 24-hour period. But if you're just downloading OCLC numbers, you can download the entire catalog you how. Um, Mark Edit has profiles here, so you would set the profile you were working under. That tells Mark Edit which um, uh, OCLC uh, profile set to use. Uh, so if I'm an affiliate, I pick my affiliate code. Uh, inside the Mark Editor, you will see that um, tools pop up. So in this case, we have uh, search OCLC's WorldCat, add and delete local bibliographic data, create and update bibliographic data, update holdings data. So again, new tools show up within MarkEdit. Um, and the search codes are slightly more robust um, than you'd find for a traditional API. Um, MarkEdit tries to facilitate opening up um, the limiters that are available. Unfortunately, not all the limiters that you can use, say, in connection are available through um, the API. I've been asking if there's a potential to flush a few more of those out because like cataloging date, and things like that, which are actually really useful, um, aren't part of the, the, um, the uh, indexes that you, or limiters that you can use, um, but you can go ahead and make uh, use of the data that's, the limiters that are here. Um, you basically just do, you know, whatever search you want to do. Um, run your search. Um, it goes and finds things. You pick the data you want and tell it you want to download it. Um, the tool goes ahead and downloads the record. Um, and now I have an OCLC record that I can work with. And this will up, depending on what your permissions are, you make changes to the record and re-upload it. It'll overlay the record. Uh, the master record in the um, uh, WorldCat. So you can actually work with data directly um, inside of MarkEdit to make changes. Specific differences between MarkEdit's API integration and connection. So MarkEdit can't lock records. So you really want to make sure that if you're doing record ed edits in WorldCat, there are changes that you're going to make and then upload because you can't lock a record. So we found that out a couple times doing large record sets where um, we assume nobody would touch a record, say, for a thesis, and somebody went in and touched a record, whether it was OCLC's quality control or somebody individually. And so that record then can't be uploaded again because the OCLC uses uh, the value here in the 005 to determine whether or not the record set that I'm working with here can be modified um, by the API when it goes up. Additionally, OCLC does some validation when the, the, the data goes up, it uses um, a specific validation element to determine whether or not the data is valid to go up forward. Um, so there's a few things that happen in the background um, when you're doing that work. 
uh, OCLC uh, tools. Um, you can, like I said, upload bibliographic data. I won't because this is an actual API. I, this is my key for working with the production data. Um, we can also update holdings. So you can set or unset holdings on particular records. You can do it by individual records. You can do it in mass using uh, tools like um, the uh, OCLC tool um, where you can update uh, WorldCat record holdings, which allows you to set a file, a profile, and whether you're going to add, delete record holdings to that uh, record. Um, so you can do those in mass. Same thing you can do in connection. I got to pick up the pace a little bit here. All right, so blah, blah, blah. Uh, just a couple other things. So OCLC um, has a number of resources that don't require keys. So those would be things like call number classifications. Mark Edit can generate call numbers. I think I've talked about this in another webinar. Um, so that can just be done. Um, again, the world cat API, batch holdings, batch update, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's talk about um, clustering, open refine, um, how you get data in and out, and then uh, I'll see if there are any questions. So one of the other questions that came up uh, specifically over the last couple of weeks um, have been folks who have had an opportunity uh, to start um, doing some professional development work. And so they're looking at um, how they can make use of open refine to edit catalog data. And one of the first things that you find when working with open refine um, is open refine is super powerful to do a lot of things. Um, but the process, uh, like a lot of things with Mark, of getting data from Mark records to OpenRefine and open those Mark data records back to Mark um, can be a challenge. Uh, OpenRefine does have a Mark importing tool that translates your data to Mark XML, essentially. Um, but I don't think they have a, a great way to pull the data back out. So a lot of times folks end up writing a lot of scripts or they end up creating delimited processes that then they have to figure out ways to merge records back together. So one of the things that I had um, been working on in Mark Edit, because I had a project that actually made a lot of sense to use Open Refine for, I had a lot of big data. Um, I needed a way to quickly uh, uh, facet on some information and make changes very quickly, um, was to create a process to facilitate the, in, the export and the import of data um, into and out of OpenRefine. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you very simply how this process can work. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and find, uh, we'll go ahead and open up OpenRefine just so that I have it here real quick. Doo -doo. All right, so there's my uh, OpenRefine instance. Um, so now I'm gonna get myself a set of Mark records. Um, so this can, you can do this either from inside the Mark Editor or from um, the tools, export, or sorry, uh, open refine and export. So I'm going to do it from here. So uh, export to open refine, um, import from open refine. So I'm going to go ahead and pick a file set. So um, uh, let's see here. Uh, I have um, a set here. So I'm going to use this as my sample. So Mark Edit can work with either MRK or MRC files. So I'm going to take this MRK file, um, save file. So you can save um, for export to OpenRefine in either JSON or um, tab delimited. I actually prefer the tab delimited format. And I'll tell you why. Um, I've been working with lots of large data sets. So the last large data set I worked with with OpenRefine had um, uh, I think it was uh, 17 million records. Um, I had two different formats I could work with. The problem with the JSON format is JSON requires validation as it imports. So OpenRefine um, by default, at least in Windows, sets a heap size of uh, basically um, 124, um, uh, 1,024 megabytes. It's um, a lot of memory. Um, but uh, for a JSON file of that size, uh, it blows the heap size and I can't import the data. Um, it's actually too large for me to import the tab limited data file too, um, but I can change that heap size file to um, say 2,024 uh, megabytes and it imports the tab file just fine. It still can't import the JSON file. Um, to import the JSON file, I actually had to set up my laptop to use swap space and set the, uh, the, um, the memory in the heap size to be um, roughly 10,000 uh, megabytes. Um, and that was 
uh, super problematic. So I tend to tell people if you're going to work with data of large sizes, put it in tab limited format. Um, Open or find tends to uh, memory wise tends to process that better. So this is what I'm going to use here. Uh, refine export. This is going to be my export file. So I'm going to go ahead and run that process. So it generates an export. Um, the file is a tab limited file. So if I went over here and looked at my uh, TSV file um, and opened it up just to look at it, basically um, it's just a file um, where there's a record number, a tag, an indicator, and content. And Mark Edit then creates um, values here to pin. Uh, fields, as, as associate fields, attach fields to records. Um, that way you can resort the records, but when MarkEdit reimports them, it uses these record numbers to determine which fields um, are attached to individual records. Uh, so let me um, go ahead and import that into OpenRefine so you can see what that looks like from a practical perspective. So I will choose my file. Uh, this is my OpenRefine. I will go next. Um, goes ahead and imports the data. Um, you don't want to store blank cells as null because that'll be problematic in Mark. Um, there are no, the, the uh, data is not enclosed and our data here in this case is Unicode. So we want our Unicode value to be preserved. Um, and we go ahead and create our project. Project gets created. Uh, when you look at Mark Edit, the way Mark Edit imports, all the indicator values show up in this indicator field, all the tags show up in a tag field record numbers determine how records get reassociated, and then this is all the content data that's here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just do something really simple, so that way you can see kind of how this works. So I'm gonna go ahead and facet here on text facet. Um, I'm gonna go to this 998, and I am going to uh, edit um, these rows, and I am going to, um, remove the matching rows. So that should delete all of the uh, 998, 980 fields from my records. Um, so if I go back to um, my record set here, you can see that the 998 has been removed from my set of rows here. So they're no longer there. Um, I could do other edits and open or find because I'm just showing you a real quick um, process here. So th that data has been removed. So now I want to bring it back to Mark Edit. So I'd like that data to be able to be brought back into um, the application so that we can do more, more, more Mark work. So we can go to export, tab delimited value. Um, see here that the tool is outputting a tab delimited file. Um, we'll go ahead and go to show my folder. It's right here in my export file. So I go um, back to Mark Edit. And I could do it from, again, inside the Mark Editor or outside. I'm going to do it from inside this time, import from OpenRefine. Um, I go ahead and select the OpenRefine file that I just created. The tool goes ahead and imports it, and it re-imports it in Mark Edit's Mark format. You'll see that the 980 that we removed in OpenRefine has not been brought back into the set because that wasn't part of the exported set. So the tools OpenRefine integration right now is really designed um, to provide a way to facilitate data going from one location to another and to do it easily. Um, so that way you don't have to sit down and write a bunch of scripts to be able to rejoin data back together. Uh, so there are some trade-offs. Um, obviously the way that MarkEdit does this kind of work is it creates a data model um, when it goes into OpenRefine and then that data model is reflected when the data gets exported back out. So MarkEdit knows how to reassemble the record information. As long as the information that you're doing and the record kind of edits that you're working with um, inside of um, uh, OpenRefine um, will work within the, and, and can, can work within the, the limitations of the data model that I've set up to facilitate data moving into and out of um, OpenRefine, then that should make um, your work uh, taking that information into and out of the system much easier for you to work with. Um, so hopefully that's that's useful. Um, let's say uh, though you um, haven't uh, had time to learn how OpenRefine works, um, but you still have need to be able to do some clustering of data either for export of records 
um, or to make specific changes. Well, MarkEdit does include a clustering tool built into the application. This is both in the, um, the Mac version and um, the, uh, the Windows version. You'll find this um, uh, inside of the, um, where is it? Oh, here we go. Uh, the data clustering tools. The tool allows you to cluster um, types of data together, it, both Excel data as well as MARC data. You pick either columns or field records. It allows you to bring the data together um, into um, something that looks like this, uh, a cluster so that way you can see all of the information that relates to um, a particular um, uh, tag. And you can then process that data and turn everything in that cluster to a specific value. Um, you can export data based on clusters. Um, you can search for data across clusters. So the application tries to provide um, some lightweight um, functionality that you might find within OpenRefine directly within uh, MarkEdit. The place where you would find that if you're interested in playing around with it, um, you can either look for it um, by typing in cluster, you get to clustering data tools, um, or you're going to find it um, inside of tools and it is, I believe, here, mark processing, clustering data tools. Um, essentially, you find a source file. Um, so I'm going to grab a, a source file really quick. Um, you can decide to index all data, controlled data, or custom data fields. So I usually, because of what I'm directly working on, I would use uh, control data. Um, what did I do here? Oh, I think I, uh, I know what I did. I'll have to fix that. Sorry, there's a, uh, I was working on the tool this morning. I think I, I, think I um, unsynchronized a value. So the way that it would work is you'd import the data and you'd see the screens that you saw inside the, um, um, the slides. I will sit down and um, make sure that I didn't put this into the current version I just released. If I did, I'll fix it. Um, so, so because I've broken this, I will fix it and then I'll um, uh, make sure it's there. But um, the slides show kind of how this works um, for folks. So uh, again, it's going to look like this. It'll have all those processes. Um, like I said, clust clustering support works for non-marked data. So that's going to be things like um, tab delimited or Excel. Um, you select columns that you want to work with and the tool allows you to um, extract columns. Um, the uh, algorithm uses two different types of, um, of uh, clustering algorithms. Um, I prefer this one because it works the best for control data. Um, the tool also has what's called fingerprinting. Um, let's see if it's uh, select clustering. Um, no, it's not on, not on my slide here. It's a fingerprinting. So that, that tokenizes the data. So that way, if you run across data that says something like Terry Reese and Reese Terry, they see them as the same thing. So they cluster together. Um, so that's kind of it. Like I said, I'll, I'll make sure that the, that error that we just saw, I'll see if that's local to my development machine or if I had um, introduced an error when I made a, a change recently, um, tweaking, a, I made a couple small changes. If I did, I'll, I'll fix it. Um, but that's uh, what I wanted to talk about. Um, I ran a little longer than I thought I was going to. Um, so if there are any particular questions, you can go ahead and ask them. Um, otherwise, um, I will um, end the uh, recording. Let's see. So I'll just leave this for a second. Um, if there are questions, go ahead and enter them into the um, enter them into the uh, the chat. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll give us a couple of minutes. Otherwise, I'll uh, and I'll, then I'll let you know when we close the meeting. And I guess why if there's a for a second here, so I'm not sure what the next session will be. I'm still kind of mulling it over. Um, I kicked around the idea of trying to do a, one of these sessions on regular expressions, but it's hard enough to do a session on that even a full day. I'm not quite sure yet how I would pull that together in an hour, but trying to think a little bit about what the, the next session will look like, um, but um, we'll see. Um, if there was a way to enhance the, the 550, um, so I guess I'd need to know a little bit more about what you're, you're interested in, in talking about for the 550. So 
again, you have to remember Mark Edit's Mark Agnostic. So the tool doesn't actually know what the 550 is. Um, so um, the way that the enhancements work would have to be designed around that structure of not having to know what the 505 actually is. So the um, enhancements would have to be either through regular expressions or through something like that. Um, so um, let's see. So I think uh, if I don't see anything else, what I'm going to do is I am going to stop the recording here.